Um, yes, so once again, um, good morning and welcome everyone to, the, to today's session. This is week 14 of the um, OLS Open Seat um, cohort call. Um, today we are going to have a call on equity, um, diversity and inclusion, and then an early skill in open science communication. We have three uh, speakers. Um, Jessica, Roland, and Malvika. Uh, please, if you want to be in a breakout room um, for speaking, indicate that by adding an S. If you want to be in a breakout room for writing, indicate that by adding a W to your name. Um, we would like to also um, remind everyone that uh, we have a code of conduct. If you experience any unacceptable behavior or you have any other concerns, please report by contacting the organizers which are Berenice, Malvika, Amy, and you at Teams at Open Life Science. Or if you want to report an issue with one of the organizers, please um, kindly do that by emailing one of the um, directors. Um, thank you. Um, we have an icebreaker question here. Um, you've had a long day and it's time to talk in some delicious comfort food. What would you choose? You have some interesting choices there vanilla flavored ice cream, one bowl of tasty soup and ice cream. I think ice cream is, is, is the popular choice. Um, there. I, I would also go with ice cream actually. Uh, so, I, <laughs> um, so thank you. And I would like to pass the on to Jessica for the first uh, presentation. Awesome, thank you, Ted. So I'll just share my screen. I just have to just zoom always confuses me where everything has gone <laughs> once you share your screen. Um, everyone seeing the screen okay? Perfect. Yes. All right, then I will kick off. So I'm going to talk about safe spaces in open source communities. Um, and I have 10 minutes. Um, in my last rehearsal, I have been a little bit over. Um, so please be patient with me, but I will try to be as quick as possible. Okay, so, um, oops, slides are not switching. Here we go. Uh, I'm Jessica Green. I use she, her pronouns. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn and Mastodon, although these days I'm not very present on Mastodon. I'm a senior software engineer at Ecosia. It's the search engine for a better planet. And I'm also a community leader at PyLadies Berlin, I'm an, a board member at the Python Software Verband. So I'm originally from the UK, but I'm living in Berlin, Germany uh, for the last 12 years. So before we dive in, I just want to clarify what I mean when I say safe space. Um, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the safe space is a place intended to be free of bias, conflict, criticism, or potentially threatening actions, ideas, or conversations. And this term originated in the LGBTQ uh, culture, but it's since been expanded to include really any place where marginalized um, minorities come together to communicate regarding their shared experience. So just to kind of give it a lens of open source and what the state is there, in 2017, in collaboration with researchers from various academic and industries, um, GitHub, uh, which is a common platform for open source uh, software to be hosted, decided to gather data on open source software development practices in communities. And they collected a large random sample of respondents uh, from different repositories on their platform. Surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, only 3% of those respondents identified as women, with a further 1% identifying as non-binary. And four years later, when the Linux Foundation ran a very similar research, they found although the landscape had changed somewhat towards becoming more representative, it was still vastly dominated by a certain demographic. So the vast majority of respondents um, identified as male, uh, there was 74% were heterosexual and 71% between the ages of 25 to 54. 82% of the respondents said that they felt very welcome in open source, which at first glance sounds like something incredibly positive. 
But when we look at the remaining 18% who answered they do not feel safe in the community, they, proportion they disproportionately sorry, came from underrepresented groups. And the report went on to further say that this exclusionary behavior has cascading effects on the feeling of belonging, opportunities to participate, achieve leadership and retention. So while these toxic experiences overall or generally might be infrequent, the rejection of contributions, interpersonal tensions, stereotyping and aggressive language is far more frequently experienced by certain groups. And in the previous survey, the one done by GitHub in 2017, 50% of all of the respondents claimed that they had witnessed toxic interactions while working on open source projects. So Python, which is one of the communities I'm involved in, is a very popular language for programmers. It has 15.7 million developers using it worldwide. It's a general purpose coding language. I'm not sure on everyone's familiarity, but it can be used for a multitude of different applications, such as web development, data science. Most recently in the uh, boom of generative AI, we've seen Python come to the forefront forefront as the programming language that is often used. Python is also an open source software and it's developed on by thousands of contributors. This is the five uh, core contributors for Python who are women um, and it is only five. This situation is also not by chance and it's been the intentional effort of the language creator Guido van Vossum and a community that has led to the engagement of developers from different communities. In 2015, during his keynote at PyCon Montreal, Guido announced his goal to recruit at least two women into the core Python development team in the next two years. And when Marietta joined, she credited his direct mentorship for helping her to join. So if you have a look at the slide and you do the quick maths, you see just by the end of the school, uh, we have two core developers who identify as women joining. Pi Ladies is one of the safe spaces in the Python community. So like Python, it's a global community, but its roots started much, much smaller. So the first ever meetup happened on April 16th, 2011, when a group of five local Python developers got together for the first ever Python ladies evening. You can read on the blog uh, that they had a great time drinking some wine, having sparkling elderflower and ginger waters, various lovely food, looking out over the LA scenery. But they discussed different aspects of the Python language and also Python women's advocacy, including how they had all gotten into the community itself. And it was clear to them from the start that this energy and empowerment was something that they didn't feel in other places. In fact, it was four years later, thank you to financial aid from the Pi Ladies community, that Marietta was able to sit in the auditorium listening to Guido's keynote about advocating for women to join the core uh, Python team. And in fact, setting in motion her later becoming a core developer. My own experience has been very much community driven. I'm a career changer. I switched into tech from being a coffee roaster in 2018. And my local Pi Ladies chapter in Berlin has been a haven for me. It's given me the space to grow, connect and feel supported. I very much consider myself to be a community slash self-taught developer because for sure this community has played a key role. As a school child, I remember being discouraged, sometimes subtly, sometimes not very subtly, uh, from sciences. And I internalized that this was not a space for me, predominantly because of my gender, but also because of my vast different interests. From the minute I entered the space of Pi Ladies, it felt different. Being around others who had a similar experience to my own gave me a new lens and the confidence to pursue my goals. I have to be honest and say not every space in tech I've been in since has felt this way, 
but it really re-energizes me to know that there is a space that I can go to and have this feeling. I've also become an organizer in the community, and I wanna share with you a few tips for building safe spaces, which I've both seen in practice and practiced myself. The first thing is that first experiences really matter, like a lot. Really depends on this first experience and entering the community, whether people will stay engaged in the community or rather leave and go elsewhere. Having a code of conduct, which is also enforced, and clear documentation of what that process looks like is incredibly important to signaling to marginalized groups that the space is not only welcoming, but safe and that they will be protected within it. Language is also very important. It really promotes what the space is about. And if language is centered around and prioritizing only a single group of people, it alienates others to, have the feel, to feel that they don't belong in the space. It's also important that we include mentorship and sponsorship and offer other opportunities to underrepresented folks, recognizing that equity is incredibly important and crucial for communities. Let's note that the pandemic saw women in tech 1.6 times as likely to be laid off or furloughed as men, and 1.5 times as likely to report feeling a greater childcare burden. So it's very important that we go into these spaces and support people where they need it. We need accessible and we need approachable communication. Accessibility here, not only talking about the typical impairments we might think of, but also considering barriers such as language, paywalls, and ensuring that it's a space where people feel empowered to ask questions. Python moved towards a forum-based uh, communication channel over a very long or very big mailing list that they had before. And this really made a difference because not everybody is comfortable to ask in such a large mailing list questions. Transparent decision-making. It's very important when we build these spaces that the decision-making process is clear and that everyone feels empowered to be involved. Highlighting contributions. It's very important for representation that we highlight the, rep the contributions of folks from these underrepresented communities, and also that we support people who are doing this work. Safe spaces are predominantly run by the people who themselves are affected or require such a space to exist in the first place. Policies in place to highlight the group's focus. At Pi Ladies Berlin, we have what we call our gender policy because while we believe education is for all and we welcome everyone to join us, we also find uh, we also have the mission and focus of supporting gender minorities in the community. So if men want to attend our space, they are welcome, but we do ask that they respect and consider the space that they are taking up. Support from the wider community, because safe spaces cannot um, exist in isolation. It is very important that we receive resources, be that financially or otherwise, from the wider community and that we have that connection. We need to go out and be connected with other developers. For example, in my experience working with Python, but as I mentioned, it's also important that I have the space that I can go to when I need to re-energize, sorry. And last but not least, it's especially important that our leaders in the community communicate these goals and their importance. Carol Willing says, many people look to the technical leaders for inspiration and guidance. So when Guido went wearing the Pie Ladies t-shirt and put a stake in the ground saying, I want women developers, it made a difference. It's really important that if we're community leaders, or in any way community decision makers, that we really advocate for these changes to happen and that we communicate their importance to the wider group. With that, I would like to say thank you for listening. Um, again, if you want to connect with me, there is my LinkedIn and my Mastodon. These are the various resources that I have used for the presentation. I will also share the slides. And I can really recommend checking out this very new podcast, if you're interested in the Python community, is called um, Podcats. 
and it is talking about some their first episode is talking about some of the hidden figures in the Python community. So I think I'm still <laughs> over by a couple of minutes, uh, but there's also time, I believe, for Q&A. Um, thank you, Jessica. Uh, that was really insightful. I personally use Python, so I, I think this is, yeah, thank you. I'm, 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 I'm supposed to be um, co-facilitating this session with um, Laura. So, with me, hi, yeah, good morning. Uh, good morning. Um, I will check on the other part if we have questions. So in the, yeah, so I, I see Malvika is in a hand. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jessica. I, I, I Talking about the transparency, I remember there was a year when Guido stepped down from this, you know, weird position. He was, he was holding BDFL, which is Benevolent Detector for Life. And that was a very life-changing moment for open source. What what did the impact of that happen? So I don't know if you want to give a bit of context for what that was for people here. Uh, yeah, so Guido is the creator of Python um, and for a long time was holding um, one of the main decision-making positions, um, which kind of got formalized in this slightly odd term of benevolent um, dictator, language dictator. So, uh, it became very clear specifically over one of the language changes. So the, the in Python, when they want to make a proposal to change the language, they call it a PEP. And there was a certain PEP uh, being discussed and it became very uh, controversial in terms of like, there was a lot of different opinions happening. Um, and I think it was essentially a stress point where it became clear that maybe going forwards, having a single person in this kind of decision-making role was not best for the community. Um, and Guido decided, as you mentioned, to take this step back and in place, they put in, um, I believe the steering council to be able to make these decisions in a more communal fashion. So I think that does, uh, I think Python is one of the communities that has um, received a lot of praise for being a very, um, good example of this kind of like community uh, driven leadership. And I think one of the important learnings there, um, which I've also seen reflected in the community, the more direct community that I'm involved in, is that you have to be open for change. And you also have to be uh, very willing um, to not have an ego, essentially, I would say. Um, thank you, Jessica. Any question from the, anybody wants to um, ask a question or write a question in the other part or the chat? If there's no questions, I would just like to say um, how grateful I am for the opportunity to speak to you all. I'm so impressed um, by the OLS um, platform and this open seeds project. So I can't wait to see what you all are uh, producing in this year's cohort. Um, I know that you just mentioned the graduation is coming up um, in the next month. So yeah, it's a real honor to be able to join you and talk about this topic. And if something comes up later, then please do reach out to me if you just want to talk about Python, PyLadies, um, or any of the topics I discussed. Yes, um, Malvika. Um, first of all, thank you very much, um, Jessica. That was really lovely. Um, Malvika, I think you have a question or comment. Yeah, I'm. I'm like, uh, this is such a great, great chance for us to ask lots of questions to Jessica, and I um, definitely want to hear more. Maybe not in this call, but somewhere else about the governance work, because I think when you entered, Roland and I were talking about the OLS governance that we've been working towards. So it would be a huge asset for us to hear back from you a bit more. Um, and also I wanted to remind that there are lots of cohort members who are not in the time zone that is suitable 
that's why they haven't joined in the morning, but you would always see that they uh, watch the recording. So the number here is probably 10% of the cohort. Yeah, thanks again. I'll pass it back to you, Laurel and Taj. Okay, so thank you very much, Jessica, Malvika, and Taj. Uh, now we're going to go to the Allied Skill Workshop, who is that's going to be in charge of Malvika and Roland. Um, I I'm going to ask openly if I should uh, make out the breakout rooms uh, in a, a couple of minutes, but if I should classify the S versus the W, yeah, okay. Uh, so um, this is the presentation. I'm going to share it uh, with the chat so you can use it and also repeat the Etherpad uh, link. And I'm going to pass the mic to um, Malika. Thanks, Laurel. Just a quick reminder from me. I see that all of you have actually S or W, so no reminder. I'll pass it to, I'm really, really excited to welcome Roland. Um, welcome is a weird sentence, a word, because Roland is always there in OLS, giving us uh, advice, um, being our mentor, and he has developed a lot of uh, workshop with us within community to build more ally skills, more equity in our leadership, and he's always helping us do better. So I'm very excited to give the space to Roland to kick us off and you'll hear from me as well. Thanks. Thanks, Malvika. Um, happy to be here. Can you see the screen okay? Uh, you'll have to say yes, because I can't actually see anyone. Perfect, I, I yes. Okay, excellent. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going, going too fast, okay, so. Uh, here's a little bit of a, a background for us to do it, you know, uh, headphones and being able to rename yourself. Uh, and we talked about before about S for spoken discussion and W for written reflection. And again, feel free to turn off your video, uh, whatever you feel comfortable with. Because as uh, Jessica was saying before, you know, I think one of the things that I, I love about OLS, that I love contributing is that they they're doing an excellent job of creating safe spaces. And since that was the sort of topic today, I think it sort of fits quite well. <clears throat> okay, so we've got Alvika and myself uh, talking about the LA Skills Workshop. Um, and we've got a bit of a welcome, a 30 minute introduction, some individual exercises, uh, a group discussion, bit of a break. Um, discussion of some scenarios, goal setting exercise, a wrap up. And there's also a bonus thing if we have time and there's interest that we sort of slipped into the end, but we'll see how we go. So just for um, a sec, my name is Roland, uh, he, him. I founded Practical Diversity and Inclusion uh, and uh, I've got a few years of experience in a lot of different things. Um, and I realized that practical long-term change is actually really, really difficult. It's not straightforward and it can be exhausting for the people who try and do it. So I, that's why I started sort of practical diversity inclusion to be able to collect resources that I'd be able to feel would be scalable and change people's minds. Malvika, over to you. Um, I am Malvika. I am a senior researcher at the Alan Turing Institute, which is my day job. And I'm also a co-lead for, uh, well, co-director for OLS. But in the last few years, last year, I have not been doing a lot in OLS because we've been very lucky to find funding, from various resources so that you could have taken an executive role. I have a PhD in bioinformatics. I've been working in open access, open source, writing research publication here, but it should be research community because I've been working a lot in community building. Uh, over the year working at the Allen Turing Institute, I have also built a community or team of community managers. Um, I have experience in computational and open science skill training. Um, I've been doing that since my PhD. And after that, I worked for an intergovernmental organization in Germany. I lived in Germany for 11 years. I'm from India, I got German nationality, and then I moved in 
London. So I have gone through this whole identity crisis of where do I belong? And I've actually used that in my own personal benefit for serving for multiple communities rather than one. So that that is reflected by all the communities that are listed on the right side. So OLS, that's an old, old logo that I need to change. I'm a fellow for Software Sustainability Institute, community member and previous strong contributor for the Carpentries. I am still in advisory committee for Metal Docencia, but I'll be stepping out uh, in January because I've been working with them for the last two years and it's been a huge privilege. And Laurel is from Metal Docencia. And as you all know, we have also received funding from TOPS, which is NASA program for open science. And I'm telling you all of these so you could contact me if any of these communities are of your interest and you would like to talk about them. Okay, next. Yeah, so we want to start with some terminology. And you would see these uh, emojis on the corner, tulip or sunflower, tulip is for me. So Roland and I know where to switch back to the slide. So you can also keep playing that side game with yourself. So what is a lie? Um, before we talk about a lie, there are some terminology that we want to talk about. These are jargon and you don't need to always understand them. Um, but for this particular workshop, we want to define them. So privilege is an unearned advantage given by society to some people, but not all. Let that sink in. Unearned advantage given by society to some people, but not all. A lot of us have different kinds of privileges and privileges also change over time. So it's not static. Other side of privilege is oppression. It's systemic pervasive inequality that is present throughout the society, which benefits people with more privilege and harm those with fewer privilege. We can also talk about oppression of different forms, uh, but here we want to talk about societal oppression that exists everywhere and we don't see them. A lot of time we don't see our own privileges, we don't see our own disadvantages, but these are something to pay attention to. And we will be talking through these over this workshop. Next slide. Continuing with the terminology, this is there is this terminology called marginalized person or marginalized community. It's a member of a group that is primary target of the system of oppression. Any disadvantages that we are talking about is often being experienced by marginalized member. We will be unpacking all of that and we will be also giving you a chance to think about what kind of privileges you have, what kind of marginalized experience you have. And it's it's an uncomfortable experience. A lot of time it's very, very hard. So um, these, you don't have to share with us what you don't want to share with us, but we are here to provide you with that space if you would like to share. Now moving to the main word of the workshop, a lie, which is a member of a social group that enjoys some privileges and is working hard to end oppression and understand their own privileges. Um, this is a continuous process. The ally can be a person who has certain privileges. It doesn't mean that they are the most privileged and have all kinds of privileges, but they're using their privilege to end oppression. And ending is not constant, obviously. Uh, ending is not one time. There is no end to oppression, but they're working towards whatever in capacity they can to understand their own privileges and use that to tackle oppression. Okay, so we talked about privileges, oppressed groups, marginalized person, and the like. Next slide. So a lie is a verb and not identity. Being a marginalized person requires no action. It's an identity. You're just given that position. But acting as an ally is about action. It's not an identity. Uh, you can be an ally only when you are taking an action. And this is why we talk about ally skills rather than being an ally, it's not a passive work. Depending on what is most relevant about you to the situation, you may switch from being marginalized or acting as an ally. In some places, I might be more privileged than you. In some places, you might be more privileged than me. If I travel from London to India, my privileges would change. If I travel from uh, India to Germany, my privileges would change. Uh, if I age in 10 years, my privileges would change. So there, this is a very changing situation-based identity, well, not identity, um, privilege that allows me to be an ally or not. Next slide. 
one example of privilege is that this is very seemingly neutral thing to do. We can walk into a shop uh, and have shopkeepers assume that I'm there to buy things and not steal from them. That's a privilege. Um, because the other side of the story is that there are self-reinforcing system where stories, uh, TV, news channels, police, legal system, they stereotype immigrants or so people with particular appearance, like the clothing that they wear or the way that they talk or skin color, which may be deemed criminal, uneducated or from lower status, which would mean that if this kind of person enters a shop, the shopkeeper may find them suspicious or may not really think that they are there to buy things, but to steal them. This kind of stereotyping continues to harm people in what we can consider neutral place. And these neutral places are social places, a shop or a mall or school or places that we work in. Um, and they do play a huge role. We may not see it all the time, but they are always in action. So an example is from Scotland, uh, Scotland Chief, um, where Sir Ian said that, and he believes that it's the first kind of police chief. And I'm sorry, I'm going to pass this to Roland because this example is Roland's example. I'm not going to pretend that I know this. <laughs> yeah, no, this is a really interesting example. And it's the first time I've actually heard a police chief say that the police that are underneath him, that the force in itself is institutionally racist. That's actually a really, really big statement. So it's actually believed to be the first of its kind by a police chief. And, you know, I, I picked this up from the BBC News and for that to come out is actually a really big thing. Um, so that's why I thought this was like, if a police chief says that about their own force, um, that, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty huge. It sort of blows away all these ideas, but oh, this doesn't really exist if a police chief said that. That's, that's a big thing. Thanks, Roland. And before this workshop, Roland and I were saying that, of course, we are giving very selective examples from the places that we have seen it. And you might be thinking about examples that resonates more strongly with you, your own system where you experience different kind of behavior or treatment. Next slide. This is my last slide before I pass to Roland. So a marginalized person's example could be a person with disability, hidden or visible or caring responsibility. We may not always know that this person has caring responsibility. They may be applying for a job where they might need special consideration, where they might need to do negotiation that other person without disability or caring responsibility wouldn't require to. So that's an added la layer of burden that they need to deal with. Another example, we can talk about a person of color or immigrant identity applying for a job in the UK. So this is where I am. Um, and there's this example also picked out where a, a British woman who's white and native speaker talks about that she has attended many interviews as the only Caucasian with less qualification and got the jobs, which is again about stereotyping when people assume or a certain characteristic with you because they assume you from a different so social status. In this case, a lie could be a person who enjoys specific privilege. For example, a person who doesn't have disability or caring responsibility, or probably a native person who doesn't get discriminated in workplaces, they can use their time, expertise, or income to reform their organization or local, national, international policies, or any kind of reformation that can benefit marginalized members. So of course, here is an assumption that a person with certain privilege have a lot more time. If you don't have to negotiate for how you want to work, if everything that is around you is in your favor, it's highly likely that you have more time uh, to invest in your own career and maybe enjoy better income or gain new expertise as a person with marginalized identities does not. So I like can use their power and network to benefit people from marginalized groups. Uh, this is something that that we will iterate over and over. It's about action. It's about what we do. So over to you, Roland. And I just just to add a little bit uh, point there that that link there is talking about how you can help as an individual uh, person to person, and not just through organisations or through policy as well. And that thing just we bring that up a few times in this thing. So. <clears throat> One of the things that uh, some a little bit more terminology, we talk about power 
And this is uh, the about ability to control circumstances or access to resources and or privileges, but it can also be a little bit more ephemeral than that. And actually, when you talk about some of the things that Jessica talked about earlier, uh, and we talked about Guido saying, you know, I want female developers. That's he, That was him exercising power and being able to try and share that power with other people as well. And that's actually a, 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 an undercurrent of these themes that we talk about. And intersectionality, uh, the concept that people can be subject to multiple systems of oppression that intersect and interact with each other. This is a, a phrase that was coined by legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw. And basically, the similar way of saying it is that the more marginalized groups you belong to, the higher your degree of difficulty is, and the more likely you're going to be oppressed. So why focus on ally skills? Uh, the reason I would say is that because allies provide opportunities for people from marginalized groups to make up for the ones that they've lost. And identifying opportunities to help is a skill. Now I wrote this uh, slide for the last cohort, and I forgot that I actually wrote this idea of identifying opportunities to help as a skill, because I actually wrote that down like about two minutes before when Malvika was talking. I thought, oh, I should add that into the slide. Um, so I'm glad I remembered from before. But this is the point. Um, if you look at this like tiny example, you might not be able to see. Ella Fitzgerald um, was saying that she owed Marilyn Monroe a great debt because she called the owner of this popular nightclub and told him if he'd book me, she'd have a front uh, table every night. And she never had to play a small jazz club again. So because she didn't get the opportunities, even though she had the ability, she wouldn't be able to get that opportunity to demonstrate her ability. And so Marilyn Monroe used her power and shared it so that she could give uh, someone who didn't need to get mentored, who didn't need to lean in, didn't need to learn new skills, they're already good enough, an opportunity to demonstrate that. And she never had to play a small jazz club again. So uh, this is a really, I actually really like this figure. And this is actually this idea of the problem woman of color in the workplace and how they come through and how the microaggressions that we'll talk about later can add up over a period of time. So this is the idea of the one of color enters an organization, there's a honeymoon period, and then you start to, you lose that honeymoon period and when you start pointing out issues within the organization, uh, sometimes it doesn't work very well. And this goes back to Malvika's comment before, and I think Jessica's comment even before that around you have to be willing to be uncomfortable when you're hearing um, negative things because really sometimes people have to explain that, hey, this is an issue for us to be able to get better. So when you start to raise these issues, the organization can start to go, hey, we're happy the way we are. We start to make excuses and then the women of color exits the organization. And a really great example is Tina Bigaroo um, the AI ethics and any bias advocate who will slide from Google. Um, and yeah, if you've ever, there's a really interesting article just recently where they compared how she was treated versus, I forgot the name of the CEO who was part of uh, OpenAI. You can see how, how they were both treated and, and how, what they ended up. So Tim can come back to the organization with the CEO of Open, OpenAI did. Yeah, that's actually, a, you can see the differences in the privilege in those sort of situations. Roland, can I ask you to check your mic? I think we, we're getting some um, sound as if you're in the water. Oh, right. I'm only going through my headphones, so what I could do is I could try and switch over. Um, let me see if I can do it. Say something. Is that better or worse? 
No, sound is sound is better. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, oh, cool, cool. All right. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a little bit of reflection to think about um, power and privilege. And a really great quote is, power and pr privilege and power often visible to people who have them. But helping to identify them helps you act as an ally. This is a voluntary exercise. All of this is really voluntary. Um, you can decide if you want to put that down, or you could have a look at other people's um, suggestions. Um, just put down what you feel comfortable. So for example, I'll be putting down that uh, I'm financially very, very privileged um, in a very stable job. Um, but there are sometimes some places where you could say it balances out uh, in some other things that I have to be able to do. But even overall, across everything, I'm very, very privileged. And uh, yeah, so why don't we go and um, are we going to pause the recording, Malvika? Um, or we yeah. Do so I think we uh, just finished up our discussion and I, I, I like the fact that a few people were happy to share uh, the things that they were surprised about and you know this is only a this is a fairly comprehensive list, but there's layers to this list as well. And I think as you start to work through um, and listen to people from marginalized groups and you start to think about these differences, um, you'll find more nuance. This is these are like these high level ones, but as soon as you start coming through there, it becomes really, really nuanced. So I'm really glad that, you know, that was the start of a journey for people. And uh, yes. That, that was really, that was, it was always, it's always nice to have this conversation with people who are willing to listen uh, and willing to reflect. And I think that's the, one of the key underlying um, things that we talk about here is this a, a willingness to listen and to reflect. And sometimes that can be uncomfortable. So thank you very much for all doing that. So what this workshop is not is like a certification or apology or a get out of jail free card. We're not representing anyone's employer or giving legal advice. And it's not really, we're not talking about whether it exists or not. Um, be assumed that you're here because you want to take action. And so talking about safer spaces again, um, you no. Know, at any time, you know, this is voluntary. You can leave or return at any time for any reason without explanation. Uh, the interactive part of the workshop isn't recorded, but it is transcribed. Um, maybe we should change that. Um, this workshop is designed to be voluntary, um, like I said before, and you can always anonymize if you want to repeat uh, sensitive stories. And I think the idea is to share the level of people you just sort of met at a conference that you like, not you just met at a conference and you didn't like. That's the sort of vibe. So basic of ally skills is that when you're actively being an ally uh, or you're stepping into a situation, you want to be short, simple, and firm. You want to be serious to make sure the message comes across. You want to play for the audience means you may be stepping into a situation where you may not be able to change the aggressors, the aggressive or the oppressor's mind. You're really there to for people who are sitting on the fence to uh, hear what you have to say. Um, practicing simple responses can help, although sometimes you won't really know and you'll be thrust into a situation. And it's also important to be able to pick your battles. Um, there have been times where I've stepped back. There's some times where I've stepped forward. You know, sometimes you need to understand where you're at as well. 
uh, because again, this can be emotionally challenging too. And treat ally actions as bare minimum expectation uh, within reason. Um, and also it, it's this idea of that you need to maybe push through certain comfort zones, but you also need to understand where you're, where you're really sitting. And so the re reflecting is actually a really important uh, thing here. You don't want to, I've seen plenty of diversity, equity, and inclusion and practitioners burn out, uh, get into, you know, really tough things and it can, and they can struggle, um, allies and people who are marginalized. So it's about seeing opportunities, aiming them, and sometimes you'll be able to see opportunities that aren't the big opportunities that we we hear about in some of these scenarios. They're actually the little small, tiny things that are these little microaggressions that we deal with. Malvika. Yeah, I wanted to actually take a step back on simple responses. Just to emphasize that like any skill, you have to practice. You can't just expect that you show up in a very scary situation and you are able to respond. I think our response is to freeze and like get shocked by what happened. Knowing some of these simple response could be as simple as, hey, that's not okay. Or we don't do that here. Hey, can you stop doing it? Right? Like, don't be worried about what else do you have to say? You know, people who are doing wrong would recognize it with these kind of simple responses. So practice, you know, it is it is like public speaking where you know that you'll have to speak in front of audience that you're not comfortable with, but we, you have practiced so much that you're on the pilot mode. So definitely this is why the skills, you have to practice it, that you need to know how to respond to a situation because it is scary no matter what. Um, yeah, so what if I make mistakes, right? Like uh, when you make mistakes, everybody makes mistakes. I make mistakes all, all the time. Our easiest action is to apologize, correct myself and move on. I should not try to justify why I made a mistake. I just made a mistake. I just need to apologize because there is an impact of my mistake. Um, so this is this is quite awkward. I want to recognize that having this kind of conversation where you're trying to reflect on your own privilege and, and on your own disadvantages is also quite difficult. And therefore, we need to recognize we are just human. We make mistakes. Um, so moving on, we have added some Fox pictures to break some <laughs> tension we might have in the air. It's quite awkward to have this conversation every time I talk about it, I learn. So it's a selfish response from my side to talk about it. Uh, so there, are, there is always a way to, uh, to break this the tension. You can have pictures. <laughs> you can build more safer space by having conversation that feels warm and fuzzy to everybody. This is your release for breaking that tension. Um, yes, next, we can keep seeing. Actually, I do have foxes in London where I live, and these foxes are trying to be domesticated, and they try to pretend cute, so you would go and cuddle them. Um, I'm very scared of them. So yeah, let's apologize. Um, there's, there's one example that I like to give. I have a colleague, a really wonderful person, and I had asked in the beginning of a workshop, what is your pronoun? And they said, they, them, or you can use he, uh, him. Um, but by the way that my brain processed how I look at things during a conversation, I mentioned them as she and her, which is not exactly what they wanted to be called. And I realized immediately, well, I did not realize immediately. I re realized after like five minutes or so, I felt really terrible. I I went and apologized, uh, apologized in front of everybody. And it feels uncomfortable, but the fact that I was misgendering them is much more worse for them. So it's not about how I feel, it's about how they felt and how I can correct that. Um, and this is one of many mistakes that I make. There's again, like in over the years, I have accumulated a lot of privileges and I don't often see them. Next. Okay, and then move on. Don't try to hang on to it. You made a mistake, you apologize, you've been forgiven or not, doesn't matter. Let's move on and assume that we have all crossed that bridge and correct yourself, of course. Next. Um, it, now we're gonna move into scenario and group discussion. 
Um, so there's some ground setting that I wanted to do, but I feel like Roland, I've been talking a lot. Why don't you take over this part? Oh, okay. Um, so I think we have about 10 people that might be, might want to split that into two groups. Is that a fair comment? And, um, and then we might want to introduce ourselves briefly. Um, and then uh, we can get each group to choose a moderator. Um, and the idea here is that the moderator is someone who can balance out. So if people are talking too much, you might want to ask and invite the others to share. One of the things that I found when someone might be uh, a little bit shy, a little bit reticent to talk, I might ask them, look, did you have anything you wanted to add or would you like to clarify whether you agreed with something that was already said? Because sometimes if people say, if someone else says something that they've said, they just say, oh, look, you know, someone already said it and I agreed with them. And But even that is actually really powerful to be able to know that whether they they agreed with what people have said. But of course, also feel free to moderate the moderator. Um, I, I'm assuming that if Malvika and I split up and we might be able to, uh, I could I could take notes for the group that I'm in. Um, and uh, just to I'll point out to the to the to the he him males here is that usually what happens is in uh, stereotypical scenarios it's usually the females that take notes. So as a male, I tend to try and I don't like taking notes. I tend to be the one asking or be the one volunteering to take notes. Um, and we can potentially rotate, rotate the roles for each scenario. Um, and of course, all of this is voluntary as well. Okay, so are we ready to open the rooms? I have two rooms created. Excellent. Oh, okay, how many minutes are we planning to be there? Like 10 minutes, according to the time now? Okay. Yeah, let's go. give 10 minutes and we'll give two minutes warning to come back because I think the discussions take, end up taking okay. longer. But there's a scenario that Roland will introduce. Yeah. Um, what we can do is we can pick one scenario across the two groups, maybe. Um, and we want to focus on how someone could act as an ally in this scenario, not as a marginalized person. And, uh, you know, thinking about you as a theoretical person that could act as an ally and has power in this situation. Um, We'll skip that part. Uh, uh, you know, how 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 have a real think about, and this goes back to this idea of identifying people, uh, how you can opportunity even in this even in this meeting in this a group, just making sure everyone's got a chance to be heard. So let's go with scenario one across the two groups, um, unless you have a strong urge to, to do that because that means we can just jump in to this one. Malvika, did you want to go and explain this one? Yeah. So this is a very simple, um, but very related to what Roland was saying, that there is assumption for the role women play in a society. So in a meeting, a workplace meeting, a woman makes a suggestion, but no one picks it up. Later in the same meeting, a man makes the same suggestion and is given credit for it. What could an ally do? It's a very simple situation, but I'm sure you can have lots of discussion on it. The Laurel will send you in the breakout room. And I I would say, Roland, you and I should just stay here because okay. we might we might dominate the discussion. And um, Laurel and Taj will be in each room. Okay. So we are ready now. Let's see each other there. You should find the invitation. There they go. Actually, I find that too. I'm just looking at Jessica's comment. I like to talk. 
especially like photography or say writing down notes or just doing it by a chat. I can talk while not actually being the front. I um yes, um thank you very much for the presentation. And I'm going to go down the <clears throat> etherpad um to see if there are assignments there. Okay, we don't have. But I would like to say thank you to our presenters today, um, Jessica, Roland, and Malfika. And I would also like to remind everybody that I uh, have yesterday sent an email regarding the graduation. Uh, please reply and indicate whether you want to have the five-minute presentation or you want to have the longer presentation. That will help in planning the uh, presentations for graduation. Also, in the first week of January, which is the 8th of um, January, we are going to have um, rehearsals for graduation. And then in the second week, we are going to have the final um, graduation for the cohort. Um, Malbika, do you want to add anything to that? Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. It was really um, nice to meet you. And then these questions were really um, interesting. And thank you all and enjoy the rest of the day. Have a lovely end of the year all. See you next year. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you.